Coming to you live from Zoom, welcome students, teachers, and those who are just genuinely curious about the American Constitution, its principles, how it functions, and the daily lives of Americans. Welcome to the four B's and the Constitution of American Life. As always, part of what we want to do just to show you that we're just not, you know, Constitution nerds is to share a little bit about uh, who we are and uh, show you that we have a broader uh, experience, a broader set of interests than just uh, the Constitution and American history. Uh, so uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about what I imagine, this is all my work, what I imagine is everybody's ideal first date. Uh, if, uh, you know, back in time when they had the first date or, uh, you, know, uh, you know, again, yeah, back in time uh, there. As always, we have Professor Tim Moore from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And my idea of his perfect uh, first date would be to go to a Wisconsin cheese fest, all right, where the musical guest would be, of course, Ry Cooter. Mm -hmm. That would be his ideal first date. Then we have Professor uh, Chris Cavanaugh. We've already talked about this, that his ideal first date would be, of course, taking his date to a Led Zeppelin co co uh, co yeah, concert with hoagies in hand. All right. I don't know what kind of cheese, but he would have hoagies in hand. And then, of course, we have Dr. James Michael Williams. Uh, his idea of a perfect day would be to pick up a six pack of whatever beverage and take that individual uh, and uh, uh, drink that six pack on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial while discussing tribal arrangements in South Africa. And then, of course, there is myself, David Richmond, and I would mix some pina coladas, get caught in the rain on my way with my date to the dunes of Pismo Beach. Hopefully that reminds you of a certain number one hit of the 1970s, which I'm still shocked was a number one hit back in the 1970s, but then again, we could go on hours about the 1970s. In this session of the Constitution of American Life, we are going to be discussing the First Amendment, First Amendment speech clause, and specifically a quote by Justice Stephen Breyer re regarding speech rights, the speech rights of students specifically, but we're going to broaden that and to talk about speech rights in general, as we hope, we hope that as we get into the discussion, uh, uh, here. We'll also be touching on the social contract uh, as well as are all forms of speech equals in the equal in the eyes of the Constitution. So I'd like to start our session uh, with Professor Tim Moore uh, here. So Tim, you've spent a lifetime uh, studying uh, the founders framers in the 18th century. Uh, uh, and so I was wondering, I was wondering when it came to the Bill of Rights, especially the speech clauses, how would the framers have defined speech, all right, in the 18th century? And what factors influenced, and, and I think we all generally know that Madison is the primary writer of this, but it has to be approved uh, through the amendment process. What are their influences of why speech has to be a fundamental right? Well, uh, in the, in, in colonial, in the colonial era, the, the primary uh, consideration when it comes to speech is well. Uh, let me let me back up. When when the founders talked about speech, they often would combine it almost synonymous with press. Um, and so, uh, it, even some of the first suggestions uh, that Madison used from the recommended Tory amendments from the state conventions they often would put speech and press together. Um, and a lot of the times there was a, a context of political speech. Um, I mean, today we talk about expression and maybe we can get into that later. Uh, hopefully we will. But I think to the founders, the, the, the context was always kind of political and speech and press were always kind of in the same phrases that they, that they used when they either spoke or or wrote, um, and uh, one of the big things was when it came to press, 
in the British context, there were these, uh, there was a set of laws, I think, done in the 1660s that actually set up in England the licensure um, policies if you had a press or if you were going to publish, uh, which later became a big issue for the Americans too. Did you have to have a license to be a publisher or, or a printer or hope have a newspaper? In England, you did. And that was one of the big deals about what they called prior restraint. So uh, speech and press were often seen um, together in a political context, uh, overwhelmingly a political context. Well, you know, so press has an early precedent, and that's the 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 John Peter is it John Peter Zanger Zinger. or Peter Zang? Zinger Zinger yeah that case, and as you said, maybe speech and press are 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 you know seen like this. Uh, but is there any kind of precedence in colonial America or any kind of situation that stands out as yeah. an articulation of, of why they would? And we can go back to even into England of why speech is considered so, so important. Like I said, I, the kids can see the connection in press. I'm just wondering if there's the same situation in speech. Um, I would, uh, if you're talking about England specifically, I would recommend a book and I actually I know you guys are going to be disappointed, but I have a couple of books to hold up here in a little bit. Um, and, you know, that's why I had to kill my camera. Here you go, kids. Uh, the Emergence of a Free Press by Leonard Levy is a fantastic uh, text focusing on press. There's information on the Zinger trial in here as well, uh, but it, it goes to, to the colonial roots of a free press and the importance of it. But I would go back, David, to uh, something called Cato's Letters by uh, two guys, Trenchard and Gordon. And um, I'll make sure I get to, to the reference on that so we can list it. And Cato's letters um, published in England uh, prior to the revolution are, are really uh, interesting pieces in uh, advocating for individual liberties, including uh, free speech. So um, there are people writing um, in England prior uh, to our ratification of our first amendment, prior to the American Revolution, uh, advocating for free speech at Cato's letters, Trenchard and Gordon. So, Chris, coming and one, back. One more, quick, one more quick thing. Um, often petition comes up a lot in the colonial context. Um, and uh, more so than, than we probably would think in, uh, in our day and age right now. But petition ranks up there too. I mean, and that has a long British tradition. There were even rules about how how you went about petitioning um, and uh, Blackstone talks about the uh, the number of people you can't have more than 20 uh, assigned a petition and then you have to have a couple magistrates sign on to it so there was a whole raft of rules about in the English context of, of petitioning too but it ranks up there big in the American mindset because they're trying to petition and in some regards they're petitioning illegally because uh, they're not going through the, the normal hoops that most British people had to go through in England if they petitioned. Uh, Blackstone made a reference to something I, I think he called it literally tumultuous petitioning. Uh, like if there were too many people uh, on this petition or they hadn't, they hadn't got the magistrates to sign. So, but petitioning is another one of those things that ranks right up there with speech and press when, they, when uh, British colonials and early Americans talk about these rights. Mike, I couldn't tell if you wanted to jump in or or not. So, well, I, I guess you know, try to try to end this this topic. Is is it is there any specific? Well, let me ask you: Does does England have some kind of common law, notion of free speech within their system? I mean, I I understand contemporarily they obviously you know don't have an enumerated you know, you know, statement of free speech like we do, but is it, is it, a, is it, a, is, is it by the 17th, 18th century, Tim, is it part of the British political culture? I think they tend to see it more that if people have this freedom of speech, as we would call it, they would configure it within the form of petitioning. Okay. Uh, they see it much more collective in that sense. And so all that to say is there's not this individualized the way we see it. There's not much of an individualization to how they configure that right. It's more of a collective. So, so Chris, at some point in our constitutional history, and, and this has been a bug up my backside for a long time, 
but uh, speech along with other rights uh, were got folded into this new concept known as expression. The, and and that, is, that is this term that we hear all the time now, freedom of expression. Well, the First Amendment doesn't say that. It says you have speech, petition, assembly, press, you know, but they fold it into expression. And my sense is, is that by doing so, they went way beyond the intent of the framers. Do you agree with me, disagree with me? What do you think about that? That by calling it expression, we've broadened it so much. Well, it, I think, I think as I understand the uh, liberties you just mentioned, Dave, in the First Amendment, I think they're there. Those are there, honestly, in, in my understanding. I'll let Tim correct me here, but those are really your po political rights. These rights are going to allow you to participate in the political arena at the time. Speech, press, petition, and assembly. And listening to Tim, I was just thinking of the English petition of right. I mean, it's called the petition of right. So I think that's an important, maybe an important document for the, the students to check out. Um, but I think that those four liberties, as I said, are, are political rights. And I think the idea of symbolic speech, I, I'd rather use the term symbolic speech than expression. We, I know we talk about free expression and it, I guess they might be synonymous, but I think in legal terms, what you're going to hear people talk about are, is symbolic speech. And I think that is, um, you know, I think that's a modern construct in terms of in terms of speech rights per se, in terms of symbolic speech. And of course, most students watching this will be very familiar with the Tinker decision, um, the Texas versus or the Johnson versus Texas decision on flag burning, uh, another very important. But these are uh, much more a uh, 20th century construct and, and probably coming out of the fact of uh, uh, some of it coming out of the Vietnam War. Right. Uh, think of Cohen v. California, which the young man was wearing the jacket with the F word on it about the draft. Some very important uh, expansions of speech rights. But I think I would use the word symbolic speech. And I think, yes, Dave, I would agree with you that it's probably moved away somewhat from what the framers of the First Amendment or the, uh, Madison intended. But um, I'm not sure that that's a bad thing. Right. Uh, understanding the power of mass communication that I mean, granted, you know, you could, you know, write a pamphlet in the 1780s or the 1790s and it would be distributed, but it's not the same as say the 1960s or the 1970s. Well, and again, both Johnson and Cohen do focus on, to me, political speech. And, and again, yes. check me if I'm wrong here, I'm fine if expression still relates to political speech, because that's my understanding of the freedom of speech, all right, in the First Amendment. They're specifically talking about the relationship of government and individuals based upon a long history in Europe of denying political expression towards those in power. But freedom of expression opened this door to where now artistic, you know, and again, artistic, symbolic, uh, 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 commercial speech also uh, is included in this, this, and it's 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 hamstrung local and state government's ability to regulate. All right, a lot of speech which I would consider problematic for society. That that wasn't the intent of the First Amendment because because a lot of this speech is not political speech. I'll, do you guys understand where I'm coming from? Oh yeah. Or? Mike, go ahead. And I, I want to uh, I want to weigh in on that, too, David. That's a great question. Yeah, I just I, I'm, I'm curious to your critique of speech becoming something larger than expression. Couldn't we make the same argument with your, what you're doing? I mean, they didn't write political. I mean, you're you're wanting to narrow it based on an understanding at the time. So to Chris's point, like maybe that's what the founders intended. I kind of want to say, who cares? Like in terms of are we locked into their imagination of what speech was going to be in the 1780s? I mean, they don't say they don't say that the, there's a right to write. I mean, maybe it's maybe it is petition, but there's nothing about like doing writing. Is it just speech coming out of your mouth? I mean, it, we know that it wasn't that narrow. So I think you're doing the same trick. You're wanting to narrow it by saying political, and where why do you get to put that in there? And then you want to take out expression when we could argue where we're in the 21st century, speech means more than just talking. 
Well, in defense, in defense of David, uh, he's, uh, what? he's 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 doing the good uh, he's doing the good deed of trying to figure out original intent, which uh, it seems to me that there was a political nature to the the definition. But to to your, I'm going to try. I'm going to sit the fence here. But it is a fair question whether we're bound by their intentions of what they saw these ex these expression things. I would like to. Um, it, it seems to me that there's a tremendous cultural shift. Uh, I mean, you get into the 20th century. And individualism, especially now, I think that the individualism um, expression, in a sense, is a logical, predictable way of seeing these, these textual statements in the First Amendment, that it's going to go beyond political, that it's going to be much more individualized, much more personalized. And so I think the culture shift that took place also means that we're going to get into is maple is a maplethorpe uh, exhibition speech you know or or um, you know any piece of art that we scratch our head at and the artist says there's freedom of expression well i think that exists in a cultural context of celebrating individualism whereas in the, in maybe in the founding period it was much more collectivized common good outcomes for these these yeah. forms of expression i i would i would just also add i'm just thinking about how if we were to think about political speech, but notions of what is political changes over time. Yeah. So for example, if if we were to take your rule, David, and be political speech, is what a football or basketball player does, would that be considered political? I mean, in the 21st century, our athletes are very much in the political sphere in a way they weren't maybe 100 years ago, maybe even 70 years ago. But then should we, should we somehow see that expression as outside the bounds of the protection? Well, I guess you're giving me kind of an Aristotelian view that everything we do is political. All of life is uh, political there. I'm thinking about the law of unintended consequences, Mike. And, and that is, and it is more in the area of culture. Uh, but now people are hiding behind the First Amendment, in my opinion. All right. to in the public square provide misinformation all right disinformation to uh elevate their speech to the point of threats and and, and it's, it's so fascinating to me that with all these things going on and you guys very well know that a number of election officials across this nation their lives their families have been have been threatened school board members people have stood up at school board meetings and threatened them all right uh, in numerous ways and i find it interesting that you know and they say well that's my first amendment right so we have we have and i think it's it's partially due to this broadening of the first amendment that everybody says i have a first amendment right to say anything that i want and and I think that's the law of unintended consequences of of moving from speech from the specific narrowly tailored language of speech to this broader form of you know expressive conduct. I mean, so I you know I can wear whatever, and you know, and Chris, to your point about Cohen, you know, part of me chuckles at Cohen, part of me kind of, but to me, Cohen opened up the door. All right. Uh, to a lot of unintended consequences about how we dialogue with each other, because if it's okay to to put that on your shirt in the public sphere, then where's the line? And anybody want to jump on that? Well, that, I mean, that's why they arrested George Carlin here in Milwaukee uh, with the seven words. I mean, is, was that political speech or was that cultural commentary? I, 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 I mean, that's. I mean, if it, I think there's more than Cohen too that, that's in play in that. In that, uh, I'm sorry, Chris. Well, no, I just was going to push back on David because the people that are at these school board meetings, and I'm, I'm well aware of this as well, as well um, I mean, that is political speech because this yep. is a political forum. These are elected officials. But we, as we well know, um, thanks to Brandenburg v. Ohio, if there is an imminent threat of violence, then that is not protected speech. And you're not allowed those. I mean, so I would say that these people that are making actual violent threats uh, that speech is not protected. And Mike, maybe you can help me with this too, because I heard to, I, I saw today somewhere, maybe on on the Twitter machine, about bomb threats at several 
um, universities. And yeah. then people are trying to take it back to J.D. Vance and saying that professors were the enemy, that kind of thing. And so there's a linkage there, I think. And if these are, you know, credible, then that is not back, pushing back against what David said. That is not protected. We know that. The courts have drawn that line on, on that imminent danger. So, um, and that is political speech in a political forum. Um, so yeah, I was... I mean that's such a, I mean, it seems to me, I mean, what Dave's raising is so important. Um, but I wonder if we're diagnosing the wrong issue. So it seems to me like David, you're wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> well, exactly. <laughs> for those of you uh, watching for the first time, uh, here we go. Um, it could be like, you know, what you're talking about in terms of um, the untruths and this sort of political dialogue to Chris's point, uh, uh, if we just have political speech protected, it's going to protect someone to get in front of the podium and say nasty things to a school board member, right? I think what you're identifying is when we, if if we do think about political speech, are we saying, okay, there's certain speech, not in any political society, in a democratic republic, should there be certain types of speech that we think is good for the health of that polity? If so, what is that? And then if so, would we not allow speech that's even political to go outside those bounds? And I know there we're taking several steps to some sort of bureaucracy that's going to tell us what we can say, what we can't say, which is steps we don't want to take. But I think what you're pointing out, David, is I think you're upset with the fact that people are saying dangerous things, unhelpful things, unhealthy things that is bad for the democracy. But I don't think limiting the first amendment to political speech gets us out of that problem well then that leads to a, it's a great segue to your field how do other countries deal with this all right it, from a comparative point of view i mean i know Eng england has no enumerated right to free speech england can suspend you know any any speech they want at any time now culturally at least in the last hundred years they've been very hesitant except you know during wartime yeah. which is a whole nother subject but but you know generally in fact i'd say they have you know at least before modern technology england had more free speech on the streets of their cities than the united states did as yeah. far as if you've ever been to london and the the free speech areas there in which people stood up you know on a park bench and, and blabbered about whatever and and it was generally political in nature there so mike from a you know, I mean, are are we any different? Do we take a different perspective? Do our laws are they more open or or more close? What, what's your you know view yeah. from from the international perspective? Yeah, there's a few things here. Um, in public opinion polls, just out getting outside the text of constitutions, we as a as a polity, as a society, we are much more per permissive of all types of speech, at least in surveys. I think it's interesting. You can ask people in the abstract, are you in favor of all sorts of speech? But then you give them a, give them a certain cir circumstance and they're going to change their minds. But that's OK. Compared to other countries in the world, we love speech more than others. Um, to your point, I looked up uh, the European Convention on Human Rights, which is if you're part of the EU, you're supposed to be following this. Article 10 outlines freedom of expression. So to your point, Dave, it's not freedom of speech. They've written down in their convention that's freedom of expression um very open except that it says there are certain responsibilities of speech <laughs> in our society and more recently that terminology has been used by the court to limit what we would call in the united states hate speech um south africa is the other example i'll share just because that's where i do a lot of my my studies south africa has a freedom of expression um, but in their constitution they specifically say that there are that the freedom of expression does not extend to propaganda for war, incitement of imminent violence, or advocacy of hatred that is based on race, ethnicity, gender, or religion that constitute that constitutes incitement to cause harm. So what South Africa and Europe have done, if they, they've kind of taken the lessons I think that we've learned in our jurisprudence with this kind of vague language, and they've put it in the document. I don't know if it's for better or worse in terms of um, well, I think it's for better, <laughs> I do, because I think it, it lets everyone kind of know this is what the rules are gonna be. Um, 
And then in Germany and France, you know, to deny the Holocaust is a is a is a crime. So they've taken some speech just out of the marketplace. So yes, other other established democracies have limited speech in a way that we we have not in our jurisprudence at least. So we we do it through court decisions, they do it through their constitution. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So well, I'm wondering what you guys think, because I happen to like it. Germany forbids certain elements of symbolic gestures and certain advocacy of ideas specifically national socialist ideas you know going back to uh to hitler uh and that's what i'm talking about to me that's a rational historical experience in which they said you know what we believe in free speech but there's going to be this area we don't have the equivalent mike and, and the rest of you, I don't feel that we have the equivalent, especially now in this chaos of what we're experiencing today, we've got really no limitations whatsoever, whether it's hatred, advocacy of ideas that, and again, I hate to go back to the Cold War and, and now praise some Cold War decisions, but you know, I, part of me is thinking maybe they got it right. Uh, Tim, you look like you're ready to jump on that. Yeah. I've often, for many years now, I've wondered whether uh, the marketplace of ideas has actually served us well. Uh, I think this, uh, this, I, I think this kind of dovetails to your question, David. Um, if, and, it, and maybe in some sense, it shouldn't surprise me that in America, a capitalist society, uh, free markets, that we would have come up with a kind of an economic concept. Mm -hmm the marketplace of ideas, um, you know, and it's just a smorgasbord of words, expression out there. So I think, I, I really do wonder whether that framework has served us well, because we all know that some, some things in the marketplace are crap and you'd never buy them. Uh, they're still there. And I suppose consumers are supposed to, you know, the invisible hand is supposed to put those companies out of business. But but the, the whole idea of marketplace of ideas to me is, is really, um, really, it's not served us well because in it, it's had a tendency to uh, communicate tacitly that all ideas are equal and all grunts or Serrano, uh, you know, piss Christ or, or, or whatever. All these things are moral equivalencies because it's the marketplace of ideas. So I, I wonder about that economic phrase and how it's played out. I, I, I think to you, I think I'm kind of piggybacking on your questions, Dave. Um, well, and, and I would I would agree. And, and, and again, here's my problem. And, and, and that is with this, this economic analysis of Jefferson's, the marketplace. All right, if we want to take, uh, you know, Adam Smith and stuff, the marketplace is supposed to have equitable access. It's supposed to have a fair playing field. And Regulation. one of the things that we've seen in, 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 in our history, not just recently, but throughout our history, when it comes to freedom of speech or expression, the playing field is not level and access is not level because the wealthy have more control over the means of communication. All right. And, and then if we do go into the most recent era, they are able to manipulate that. And there's nothing that we can do about that because of this romantic notion by Jefferson in the marketplace. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, so that's my my take. And I, I agree with you, Tim. There's there's a problem with Jefferson's notion of the marketplace. Well, I, I, I've got to jump in here because I, I understand what you guys are saying. And I'm, I always think of when I think of marketplace of ideas, I think of Justice Holmes' dissent in Abrams v. U.S., yeah. Uh, where he switches, uh, you know, from writing the opinion in Shank in 1919 to Abrams, where he's, he writes a dissent in, a, in the market. And he doesn't call it the marketplace of ideas, but that's what comes out of his writing as a marketplace of ideas. Um, and this is my cue to hold up another book for students. Sorry. Uh, because I think it, it's a great case study to see how Holmes changes his mind in a matter of months from Shank to Abrams. Of course, this is the Sedition Act we're talking about now. So we're talking about wartime powers. But uh, this is a book. I hope the kids can see it. It's called Free Speech in the United States by a guy named Zachariah Chaffee Jr. It's originally published in the 1940s. Uh, this is a 1967 version. It was Chris, a Chris can I ask, does it have pictures? <laughs> um, 
Uh, sadly, David, no. That's Miller v. California. You're looking for Potter <laughs> Justice Stewart. So. <laughs> I'm um, sorry. Go ahead. No, uh, that's a, and students. That's a great uh, case on uh, pornography, and, and I'm sure that hopefully your teachers have told you Justice Stewart's famous line of, about pornography. He's not sure what it is, but he knows it when he sees it. But um, Zachary Chaffee has written extensively, has written extensively on the idea of free speech and coming out of these sedition cases, along with Shank, uh, Eugene, the Eugene Debs case, and others. And I think he has a huge influence on uh, uh, on Holmes and getting him to change. But here's the problem with the market, or the, here's the problem with what you guys are advocating, at least as I see it. Leadership changes, right? And we see right now there's a, the, a you know a struggle for the you know the leadership of our government and control, and we see this at the state level as well. What happens when you know uh, we get leadership that will limit what we think should be protected, but will allow people to, to carry tiki tortures and chant "Jews will not replace us"? As much as that is vile and reprehensible and a terrible thing. Um, I, you know, I, I, I worry who sits in judgment, who becomes the arbiter of what is allowed and what is not. I, and, and, you know, what happens is in this marketplace concept, we'd like to think that when we get this hateful, bigoted speech, that the oxygen has been removed from the room. But the trouble is we get people in positions of power that put oxygen back into the room that allow uh, this this stuff that we would like to see go by the wayside as a you know uh, like Coke Zero or something that doesn't get purchased anymore. But when we pe have people in leadership that will put that oxygen back in the room to allow those flames to come in. And I've always advocated this. The First Amendment protects your right to be a racist. It protects your right to be a homophobe and Islamophobe. You, you have the you have that ability under the First Amendment. We may not like it. But the thing is, we have to create the, the public spaces that don't allow those ideas to thrive. And unfortunately, we are in a position right now where we have leaders that, again, have pumped that oxygen back into the room. So I worry about who sits in judgment of what is allowed and what is not allowed. I think, it's a, I think that is a slippery slope. Does that make sense? Yep. 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 Mike, do you want to jump in on this? Yeah, I mean, I just... I'm, I was still thinking about this marketplace of ideas as an economic concept, and someone mentioned Adam Smith. Adam Smith also wrote this uh, book called Theory of Moral Sentiment. Moral sentiment right? yeah. And here's where you have my a copy to hold up. I don't. Oh, <laughs> okay. Sorry. Um, I don't even have any money to hold up. I can't even show I'm a capitalist. I got nothing. <laughs> um, well, I think you're probably getting a check from Dr. Pepper, aren't you? I, I should be. I should be. And in and out for sure. Um, <laughs> but here's, I mean, I look. I really struggle with this because I agree with you to a point, Chris. I I do also think about like this idea of like this idea of virtue. This idea of like um, we for our democracy. Like this, the whole point of this is for our democracy to thrive, right? I mean, that's that's the that's the end product, and there needs to be a certain limit in the marketplace. I mean, the marketplace, someone makes the rules. We, we, don't allow, we don't allow each other to sell human organs, right? And it's not because we couldn't make money off of it, it's because we, there's certain things we say, we're just not gonna allow it because that's not the kind of society we are. Now, I can say this, more my argument breaks down is that our founders are not the role models of what it looks like to be holding up virtue and maybe moral sentiments because you know they're writing the most most vindictive, mean um, public discourse, public political discourse at the time. So I don't have a strong footing there, but I do think that we are saying things and doing things right now that I think are outside the bounds of what we should be saying and doing in a healthy democracy. I don't know if we want to create a bureaucracy <laughs> to to um, police it, and maybe this is where we segue back to the schools. I don't know. It just seems like. Pandora's box has been opened and we are now dealing with some very dangerous rhetoric um, that, that um, I don't know, I don't think bodes well for the democracy. Well, you're absolutely right. This is a good time to segue because 
uh, the students are asked to deal in a more more specifically uh, uh, with schools and to respond by a quote uh, from uh, the Mahoney Area School District uh, case of 2021, the most recent case, I believe, with a student speech, a quote by Justice Stephen Breyer, where he says, we do not believe the special characteristics that give schools additional license to regulate student speech always disappear when a school regulates speech that take place off campus. So kind of we're dealing with social media and stuff. That's that's the essence of the case. But I want to go back to what is considered the landmark case, uh, I think, in, in student uh, rights. Uh, and Tim, that is Tinker, Tinker v. Des Moines. And I think Chris has already mentioned uh, that case. Do you feel it deserves that uh, elevated tile, title as, as landmark case? Uh, and the reason I ask that is, as I wonder, did it really help establish student rights on campus if, if you really studied that case? What are your thoughts about Tinker? Well, I um, I, it's a great question because really there is a paradox in the Tinker decision. Uh, on the one hand, um, it does carve out, I mean, it opens the door slightly to this notion of student rights. But the big caveat, I mean, as, as and unfortunately, a lot of people don't know this, that in, in the Tinker decision, there was this, uh, however, if, uh, if, in, if, if you express yourself or speech yourself or, or, I mean, there was a whole series of cases that came after this, and Chris and Mike can do much better than I on those. But the caveat was, if your speech or your expression disrupts uh, substantially or materially the functioning of the school, administrators can shut it down. So on the one hand, uh, the court giveth and then the court taketh uh, on this idea that if an administrator thinks it's going to screw up the way his school works today, it's not going to happen. So uh, is it landmark? I think if we go back to David Adler's definition uh, in a previous episode, yeah, because it's kind of ground zero for all cases to be considered against like when new expression cases come up. Uh, so I think in that sense, it's landmark, but it, I, I'm not willing to suggest it's all that in a bag of chips in terms of student liberty and rights because of the caveat. I mean, wasn't that the essential issue in the bong hits for Jesus case too? Uh, uh, but yeah, I think it's a mixed bag, David, to answer your question directly. Chris or uh, Mike, uh, thoughts about Tinker? I think it's, I think it's a high watermark for student rights. And I think we have to consider the time frame as well and the, the what was happening in the country in terms of the Vietnam War. Um, this is where you know, we mentioned Cohen v. California about the young man with the F the draft on his jacket. Um, so <clears throat> I do think it establishes a high watermark for student rights um, addressing it. And I think actually the Mahoney decision is really one of the one of the um, it kind of comes back and kind of reestablishes some some student rights vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, school policy, because what's happened is you end up with school policies that are um, basically, I think certain lower courts have ruled over broad and over vague, because you like a you know I, I'm trying to remember I don't know the details of this I'm sorry I'm kind of talking out of my ear, but I believe it was a young lady who was a uh, uh, she's a volleyball player and she was with her friends in a sleepover and had uh, texted some stuff or posted something on social media somewhere, social media. And, um, you know, she was suspended from the team and they used the, this, this policy in place that many schools have that, um, the a school can determine your online behavior 24 seven and they get to decide what crosses the line. And I think some courts have pushed back on that, saying it's overbroad and over vague. And I think the Mahoney decision is the first Supreme Court decision in a while that actually kind of establishes a line for schools. And schools are in a tough place, right? Because social media and posts on social media take up a lot of time because schools have been asked to do more and more and more, right? Uh, where it used to be a parental issue, now uh, a kid posts uh, some type of threat or something like that not necessarily like a, a serious threat but you know call somebody a name and then the the opposing parent what's 
wants the school to do something about that post on a social media. So it's a, it's a very tough area. And I think the Mahoney decision, as I said, kind of real establishes somewhat of a line, though, if you read the entire opinion, um, the court kind of punts on this as well. Uh, they, they don't give clear guidance in for schools to follow, they say in this case. But if you look at Tinker, I think it's a high watermark, because if you look at the cases that follow Tinker, that as Tim said, will all will cite Tinker, what you start to see is a curtailing of student rights. Whether but is that it, isn't, that, isn't that, Chris, because of Tinker? I mean, I think, I think Tim yes, mentioned it, that, that there's, there's the poison pill. It, it is, it's exactly what Tim mentioned. There's the however, because right, what, it, how, how the courts have been able, or, or how the schools have been able to do it, because they've been really proven that that speech, whether it's a 14-foot banner that says, Bong is for Jesus, right? Or in the Bethel v. Frazier case, or in the Hazelwood v. Kuhlmeyer case, which is a, more of a student press case, they, the, um, the courts have said basically that, you know, the schools get to decide if it's interfering with the educational process. So let me ask you, how is Tinker a high watermark if in fact Tinker sets up the next 40 years of school, you know, First Amendment cases in which, uh, you know, that poison- Well, it's a high watermark because the court said you can't kick these kids out of school for in a black armband. That speech that expression is protected. Well, well, why not? So that's less? why it's a high watermark. But then when the however part and the, through time, what you start to seeing is a curtailing, which means the water is receding in my analogy. Well, Mike, you look like yeah, you I, want to jump in. I mean, yeah, I think what's important about it is that um, I think it's an acknowledgement by the court that schools in a very sort of John Dewey sense should be places where we practice democracy, right? They're, they're not just places where we're teaching the widgets how to be widgets. Like we want people to be critical, thought-provoking citizens. And I think that without saying anything, right, the right wasn't there. So Tinker says, look, the right exists. And and I would I would push back, I would push back on establishing a line a little bit to Tim, but I agree that how that line was drawn, maybe school administrators didn't draw it the right way, but I think that's what constitutional law is all about. I mean, in terms of, I would not want the rule to be freedom of expression exists in schools, no matter what. I mean, I think there has to be a, a recognition of if, if the, one of the purposes of the institution, right? Just like courts don't allow freedom, all freedom of expression. If it's gonna disrupt the actual trying to do the case, they have to like stop the expression. I think that that as a, principle that makes sense to me because i also think that there should be a rule nah, i'm not going to go there. i'll go there this is not really what i believe but should we allow speech up until when it disrupts disrupts the health disrupts functioning? yeah disrupts <laughs> ah, yeah. there's can a word for the day are we filming can we can we cut that are we, can <laughs> we cut? i don't know i'm about to be apoplectic but go ahead i am too it's well um <laughs> i just think that there should be some lines. There should be some lines. And I have no problem with so, the principle of the line. Well, did Tinker this, did Tinker kind of put its school administrators in the role of determining appropriate time, place, manner? This is this, that's a that's a great point because if you listen to the oral arguments of Morris v. Frederick, which is the Bong His for Kate Bong His for Jesus case, which in addition to getting to listen to uh uh notorious RBG talking about bong hits, which is just in itself kind of entertaining. Um, yeah, Chief, Chief Justice Roberts, in a very funny but uh, realistic way, is talking about the assistant principal going across the street, you know, during this, the, the unfurling. And so he's ripping on the young man's attorney saying, well, should she have been thinking about Tinker, but then gone to Bethel v. Frazier, and then she should have gone to this, the case. And so, you know, talking about an assistant principal is going over and asking these guys to take the banner down, right? So... Of course, I mean, you. The, the, that's the reality of the situation because you're dealing with people that are administrators in high school. And my goodness, they have a tough, tough job, a really tough job. But their knowledge, some of them, I let me be careful here, I'll be really careful. Some of them, their knowledge of case law, is, I'm going to say is limited. So they, and the court doesn't, 
I'm going to use one of Tim's lines. The court, they draw squishy lines. And so it becomes difficult for the schools to know this is the line and you've crossed it. Well, Mike and you kind of, I think, take us to one of the key questions of this is, is all speech equal? And Tim had talked about that uh, earlier here. You know, one, Mike talking about, you know, are, are, are we going to create, you know, levels here uh, of what speech is more important? And, and, you know, I think both in general society, but also in schools. See, I don't have a problem with Tinker and, and wish the court hadn't put the poison pill in there. I don't have a problem with West Virginia Bar Bar versus Barnett because that deals with a fundamental right and I also, I think, expressive speech uh, in a way um, there, because those are dealing to me with core principles of what we want. Bethel, you know, I love it because the kid never says a bad word. There's no cuss word in that speech, right? And, and I was shocked. I actually lost a bet with a local friend who was a, was a municipal court judge. I lost a bet on that. I couldn't believe that they ruled for the school district on Bethel. You know, uh, but now I'm a little bit older and I guess I probably, so, so I guess my question to you guys is both in, in one, in general society, you know, should all speech be treated equally or should certain speech have greater protection or greater limitations and same on in, in schools, you know, it's, it should, you know, if, if a kid wants to make a speech or an expression about the school dress code about other policy of the school to me that's political but if the kid just you know wants to mouth off and you know and 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 scream and cry about his favorite band or whatever i you know in a way that's you know disruptive to the school day that's not protected or dress well that's so, that's actually you're, talk, you're talking about mahoney because you know the, the mahoney is a young lady who used snapchat right had a limited viewership somebody screenshotted where she was like F, you know, cheerleading, F softball, F school, not directed to any one person, but, you know, she was having, she was frustrated with uh, being, I think, the relegated to the JV squad for cheerleading. And so then this is where the courts came in and said, you know what, that's, that's protected. So, I mean, this is where, the, the, again. Um, no, I don't think they said that's, per, per, I think when Tim talks about time, place, and manner, they're talking about time and place there. Not the well, manner, because they, they said in Mahoney, you know, schools do have right to regulate speech that's off campus. All right. You know, so I, I think they're taking that that element of time, place, and manner and saying, listen, the school in this case, because she wasn't talking about, she wasn't broadening this to a policy debate about the school, right. Chris. She was just venting her anger. And they and they and they and they found for her. Yeah. So that's uh, I understand point. that. And so, uh, and I you know and and again, but the time and place of when she did it, you know, and, and this is what complicates the whole thing. Actually, where, actually, that's that's David. That's you no, know, because I'm going to back up. It was about the time and the place. She was off campus. She was in, at a, at, a, at a place, right? So this is and where that's the why they said, ruled for her. That's part of it, right? That's part of it as well. If she would, if she had done the same thing on campus, would it have been protected speech? If she stood up in the middle of the class and said, uh, F cheerleading. If she, F if she stood in the middle of the quad or whatever your school campus looks like and said the same things, would she have no. been protected? No, no, it is time and place. Right. It's not so, manner. They didn't say, you know, what she said is protected. Yeah. They said where she said it. All right. And, and uh, you know, the places she said it, the time that she said it, that's, you know, that's protected. No, also, David, you were a little wrong there because the manner was protected because it was using social media to a limited audience that was supposed to go away on Snapchat. So that manner was also protected as well. Yeah. So that was that was part of it. So. Tim yeah. and, and, and Mike, before Chris and I go down the rabbit hole on this. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we're already there, there, brother. <laughs> no, I mean, you're, you're asking us to imagine if some speech Well, the question says, what forms of speech deserve greater protection? I just want to point out to the students that we can talk about that and have that debate, but the Supreme Court has made very clear that any sort of content content based regulations is going to have to fulfill a very high standard. I mean, the court has made it really hard for us to set up that kind of jurisprudence, right? 
I mean, if a school were to say, um, political speech is okay, but any speech that is um, hurtful to your classmates is not allowed. To me, that, that kind of regulation is gonna be struck down just because it's a content-based regulation. And the time, place, and manner stuff is all, it has to be content neutral, right? So yeah. I'm just, your question's a good one. I think, I mean, it's obviously, it's a great one because it's a we the people question, but um, it's, it's kind of, I mean, this is where, again, students, and we, we talk about this almost every episode, we are dealing with a very, um, an old document, right? That we have used the courts and we've used lawyers and we've used civil society to kind of breathe life into it generation after generation so it makes sense in our times. I think, as Tim said earlier, what South Africa and Europe have done, if they, they've taken what the court has said, or, or a court has said, and they put it in the text. So if, if we could rewrite the text, would we say that certain speech is more important? Could I make that argument? You bet I could. But I think we're kind of limited to even do that constitutionally right now. So I'll stop there. And also, I mean, I vaguely remember this. Um, maybe I've got it wrong, but hasn't our Supreme Court said that there's a universe of free speech, but there's a couple of zones where it's um, those like obscenity, uh, fighting words, commercial speech, you know, these things are regulatable and they're not within this, you know, um, this uh, unlimited yeah. zone of free speech. So they, they've attempted to create these spaces where they're not protected. And so I guess it, the way I'm kind of hearing our discussion, is it fair to say the schools are wrestling with uh, those same issues within the context of a school? Is there all kinds of free speech, but there are a couple things that are off the table. Uh, and so in it, the way I read Tinker is it gave school administrators the ability to be the gatekeeper on that. Um, and of course, in the age of which we live now, there's always kind of second guessing of all kinds of gatekeepers, whether they're in schools or police forces or educators or, or uh, you know, uh, clergy. And there's all kinds of gatekeepers that we don't trust anymore. Yeah. So Go ahead, Chris. Well, no, I was just going to echo what Tim said in terms of like uh, the, the fighting words doctrine out of Chaplinsky. Certainly, I mentioned Miller v. California and obscenity. Uh, child pornography, we know, is definitely not protected. Um, uh, certainly, uh, libel, the libel laws, if you think about New York Times versus Sullivan, a very famous case as well. Uh, you know, the idea of putting on clear guidelines for being able to sue for libel. Um, and yeah, the problem with schools, though, again, is um i think schools have been asked to take on this larger and larger role in society that they're probably not equipped to do and the idea of monitoring social media 24 7 um which you know that's what some people in society would like schools to do because they want us to i say us as a, a teacher they want us to fix that problem and we are just not equipped to deal with that Schools are just not equipped to deal with that because then you get cases like Mahoney and we're going to get another case, you know, probably not in the future dealing with the idea of schools being able to regulate students use of social media. Uh, and Mahoney is not a bright line by any stretch well, of the imagination. Yeah. You bring up a, a topic, Chris, that's a little bit, you know, it's, it's related to the question. I think it's a, a current issue that that we're discussing. I think it relates to schools because you just talked about social media um, and it is, I guess this would, I don't know if this is, I guess this is manner and that is the social media platforms. Are, are you one who leans towards that the government should be given regular regulatory power over the social media platforms uh, as far as regulating, you know, I guess well, speech, no, we you know, where, this where do you fall on that? We had this discussion earlier, and I was really leery of um, originally, you know, talking with you guys. And I listened to what you guys had to say about, you know, we regulate, um, you know, power companies. Ma Bell was broken up. Uh, phone company students, that was a long time ago. Sorry, back when we actually had a wire on a phone kind of thing. Well, uh, and they still regulate power companies as well, too. Yes. And so and I'm thinking with what we found out recently about Facebook and the idea of algorithms for profit 
which actually has driven part of this issue we've been talking about, given oxygen to the, a lot of the speech we would like to see maybe not have that oxygen. I'm leaning more towards some type of uh, regulatory agency. And I was just listening to a piece on NPR today um, about the metaverse. And this is what, uh, uh, who's um, Zuckerberg's talking about with changing Facebook to meta. And uh, a scholar was talking, and I don't know who it was. I'm sorry, it was on NPR, but uh, it was very leery about one company controlling this. Because as we've seen, Facebook was more than willing to put profit over the, the people. And so I'm leaning towards some type of, and I don't know, man, I'm, I'm, I'm like feel com so conflicted in this. Um, but when you're putting profit over the good of the society, um, I think that you're looking at some type of regulation. Well, we were able, we were able to regulate, you know, back at the early um, 20th century. Uh, and, and we were able to regulate the three major networks. I mean, arguably airwaves. that's why we Public had airwaves. the Federal Communications uh, Commission. So it, it seems like there's precedent for us to think about regulating a monopoly of communication. Uh, we did with the three networks. Great point. Yeah. Mike, any thoughts about uh, social media? Because it is the it is the primary platform of expressive of, of speech and expressive, you know, action in some ways. Uh, there are you know, expressive speech uh, in many ways. Any thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I just keep coming back. I think to the, one of the first things Tim said as we got started. We just talked about the United Kingdom, about how speech there has always been more of, of a collective theme, right? Like thinking about the collective, and it just seems to me like we've all kind of been bringing this up. Where is how do we balance sort of the societal sort of needs and um and I, I think dave you'll disagree with what i'm about to say but i think i think words matter i think expression matters i think it has an impact and i think when i think about what chris said about facebook and one of the revelations that came out with this research is that they knew that what they were allowing was causing um mental anxiety for teenagers they knew it and they wanted to keep doing it because they want those eyes on that because they want those eyes on it to get the parents eyes on to buy stuff right and that to me is like it brings up the larger question of how far do we either let the economic model or the marketplace of idea model go without even bringing in what's for the good of society and under current jurisprudence i don't that's just it's it's a harder factor for us to bring in, given the way the law has developed. And I think that's too bad. And I think that's a great insight. And I was thinking about that in regards, you know, we, Tim and Chris both talked about, you know, we have limits on speech, we have fighting words, and we have obscenity. But I would contend that we've, we've given up on that. I'd like you to point out a recent situation in which fighting words, all right, has been adjudicated in which obscenity has been adjudicated you know because and again i go back to my original point we have broadened this freedom to such a degree that even those what we would consider common sense regulations all right it would seem to me that you know again that fighting words happens every day and nobody's held accountable for that well the the public forum is so i mean the public forum is gargantuan it used to be speaker's corner at hyde park right now it's i mean the the delivery system is is unbelievably more complex the public forum the public space where communication takes place is infinite so i don't know i mean the genie's out of the bottle on both the delivery system as well as what is the public space uh i i don't know how we can put the genie back in the bottle with those two things well, we'll we'll give it to the students to uh, figure that out, and, <laughs> and I and, yes. I, and I and I do want to I do want to you know you know acknowledge Professor Kavanaugh's statement that I feel conflicted about this. And students, I want you to think about uh, you know, here are four individuals with I've said before 150 years of experience studying and teaching the American Constitution. Uh, three of us, uh, you know, are, are pushing Social Security and 
uh, Medicare to uh, start providing us uh, assistance. And uh, we're, we're conflicted about these questions and these issues. Uh, and again, if you if you had any sense of, of me and, and you talked to uh, these friends of mine 20 years ago, if they would have thought the words coming out of my mouth, that these words would have come out of my mouth today, they would have been shocked. I have evolved and changed and I start to see the world uh, differently. So I really appreciate Professor Kavanaugh's insights on, on just how difficult these issues are. And so we're not asking you to have right answers. So we're not asking you, it, this is just in general in life, but to be thinking about this and understand the fundamental principles uh, and, uh, you know, and how we try to work out uh, these problems. And I'll leave the final words to Professor Kavanaugh. Well, I just wanted to throw this out there. And yeah, David, we should be conflicted. Everybody should be conflicted because if you believe you have all the answers, then you're not thinking enough. Um, I just wanted to, I mean, we talked about some cases where the court has drawn the line. There are two opinions and they're minority opinions, right? But I think it's good to be able to look at minority opinions to give some kids this, where to hang their hat. Uh, I would go back to one of my favorite justices is Justice Jackson in a free speech case called Terminal of Chicago. And he writes the minority opinion. He, so he loses. And this, this guy, uh, Terminello, is, is, I believe, is a Chicago statute that was restricting his speech, was unconstitutional. And the majority agreed. But Justice Jackson had a famous line in this case and said, the Constitution is not a suicide pact. And what he meant by that is we are not going to follow everyone's individual rights to the point where we're in a state of nature. There has to be a line drawn somewhere. And I would go to one of my ju the justice who's not on my list of favorites, and that's Justice Alito in the Snyder v. Phelps case. And that was the case where the Westboro Baptists were protesting a soldier's funerals, which is like, in my, my personal opinion, as we're coming up on Veterans Day, uh, one of the most reprehensible things that people could do, right? And, and you students, if you've not looked at Snyder v. Phelps, you should check it out. And it's, it's very powerful stuff. But Justice Alito, in his, in his dissenting opinion, again, not in the majority, said, we've got to draw the line somewhere, right? The idea that, yes, we have a marketplace of ideas, but let's, let's, there's, we could agree that this is so reprehensible it should not be protected. So just two dissenting opinions students to look at, Jackson and Terminal v. Chicago, which I believe was in the 40s, uh, 49, and then Snyder v. Phelps, which is a much more modern case, Justice Alito. Check those out. So it'll give you a place to hang your argument on for limiting things. So there's your homework assignment, uh, students. We hope we have given you uh, some things to think about and uh, given you an understanding that these are complex issues that are not easily uh, solved, uh, uh, nor is there any, any, any easy answer. We look forward uh, uh, to seeing you next time, and we will be kind of continuing on this theme, looking at uh, uh, Unit 6, Question uh, 1 on uh, liberty, uh, uh, and in some ways, uh, speech liberty. Uh, there and citizenship. So until then, peace, love, yogurt tacos. Bye-bye, bye-bye.